Okay, second part of this lecture, train satisfaction problems. So where were we at? We were looking at search. And what was search for? Well, it was about something, some world, where there was a single agent, deterministic action so far, and fully observed state, discrete state space. A lot of problems can be formalized that way. And we saw a bunch of problems that can be formalized that way. And what it comes down to is, Sometimes simulating sequences of actions, hopefully not too many sequences of actions, until you find the sequence of actions that's achieving the goal, and hopefully you can even guarantee that's the optimal sequence of actions to achieve the goal. You might have problem-specific heuristics that help you guide your search, and that's how you tune in on the specifics of the problem. Now, that's one way to use search. There's a whole different kind of search problems that have a little more structure to them in some but think of the first type of problems, think of the thief trying to pitch the diamond out of a very highly protected vault, going through all kinds of acrobatics to avoid maybe lasers that would detect him and so forth. When we think of an identification, it's not about exactly how you get to the goal. So here it's about, uh, here it's about the sequence of actions, how you get to the goal. In that identification, there's still search problems, but how you get to the goal doesn't matter anymore so much as the fact that you found a goal, that you identified a goal. Might be a little abstract right now, but we'll see a lot of examples in this lecture. The key difference is going to be that we don't care so much about the sequence of actions, but the fact that we achieve a goal, found a goal. So, the search satisfaction problems that we'll look at are an example of such an identification problem. Um, what are they? So a standard search problem, the state is a black box, and sometimes it's some arbitrary data structure. There's a goal test which tells you whether a certain state achieves the goal or not. And the successor function is something that tells you from this current state, is there an action available to you? All right, so that's, that's all about, kind of in, the, in a black box way, trying to get somewhere, and hopefully you get there. Once you get there, all of a sudden you realize you got there. So you can think of this as somebody proposing plans, and then at the end when the full plan is proposed, let's say a plan to color a map, which is going to be a recurring problem in this lecture. When the full plan is proposed, it's not whether that plan achieves the goal or not. Constraint satisfaction problem is a search problem with more structure to it. The state is now defined by a set of variables, xi, and in each variable has a domain, vdi, or maybe the domain. Of coloring a map, which will be a recurring example, each region in the map corresponds to a variable, and then the possible colors for each region, that's the domain. Then a goal test now is not just checking whether a full map coloring satisfies your goal conditions or not. A goal test now is decomposed into a set of constraints. So there's a bunch of things that have to hold true, and you have access to each one of them individually. So for this map coloring problem, it's, for example, neighboring regions do not have the same color. And so there's a bunch of constraints there that you can check. In principle, as you go along, you could check whether these constraints are satisfied or not. You don't have to wait till the end till you color the entire map to be aware whether you satisfied the goal test or not. So that's key here, is that the goal test now consists of a set of constraints, and often you can check them as you go along, as you find more and more variables. All right, so it's a lot more like a procedure now. It's something where you have a bunch of instructions that need to be satisfied, and if everywhere along the way you can check whether you're on the right track, or maybe that no matter what you do from there onwards, you're never going to satisfy the goal test. If you already colored two neighboring regions, if you already colored two neighboring regions the same color, there's no way your future coloring activity in other regions is going to help you out anymore. All right, here's an example. What we need is when we look at the problem. All we need is a set of variables, a set of domains associated with the variables, and then we need a set of constraints that need to hold true between the assignments of the variables. And what's actually behind that, what's the very 
through generic formulas and we get the allows us to solve a lot of real world problems. What are we do to this representation? And just like we did for search, so far we'll look at very general purpose algorithms that will allow us to solve this entire class of problems reasonably efficiently. So, let's look at some examples. First example, let's look at map color. So what you see here is a crude map of Australia split up in uh, several regions, which correspond to its states, some of them are called territories. Um, and the problem is to color in the map in a way that no neighboring region has the same color. You have three colors available to you, red, green, and blue. So how do we formalize this? Well, what are the variables? The variables are the regions. So we have each of these regions as corresponding to a variable. And the domains, for, in this case, each variable has the same domain. Each variable has a domain of three colors, red, green, blue. What are the constraints? Um, well, adjacent regions must have different colors. That's the way we define the problem. All right, an implicit way of doing this, uh, implicit means you have some procedure to check what the constraints are satisfied. So it could be something where you say, you have a bunch of functions you can call. These functions are defined for each set of each pair of satisfied with some piece of code. That's implicit. Explicit, which can be useful for some scholars to have it available. That way, if and explicit constraints look like this. What you do here is for each set of variables that participate in the constraint together, in this case we have two variables, in this example, WA and NT, participate in a constraint together because they are neighboring regions, and that constraint is saying they have to have different colors a way to explicitly encode this without having to write code, so it's more generic in terms of how to feed it into solvers, you specify a, the set of valid assignments to that pair of errors. A red and green is a uh, six choices here that are okay for these neighboring regions. All right, the solution is Anything that's an assignment that satisfies all your constraints is a solution to the problem. So for example, this assignment here is a solution. Often there is more than one solution. Sometimes you have too many constraints and that's possible. All right, that's the first example. Second example, N queens. So this is a puzzle. Um, what are you trying to do here? You get a chessboard and the goal is to place queens on the chessboard in a way that no queens attack each other. So how do queens move in chess? They can go vertically, horizontally, diagonally. So you want to place your queens on the chessboard such that there is never a diagonal, horizontal, or vertical connection between two queens. This here is an example of a solution. None of these pairs of queens attack each other on, in this configuration. This is a generic problem. This is the four queens problem, where you have a four by four board, four queens. In general, n queens means you have a n by n chess board with n queens you want to place. Okay, so let's see. Here's the first formulation. Often there's multiple ways of doing this. The variables are for each location on the board, 16 locations, there's a variable. That variable will encode then whether there's a queen in that location or not. The domains are 0, 1, booleans, boolean domains, saying whether indeed the queen is present or not. Constraints, well now we have to encode somehow that no two queens can attack each other. Okay, so if you do this in the explicit way, what we're doing here, all right, implicit would just be a piece of code that checks these things. Explicit is something like this, you say, xij and xik, which are two variables, if, so xij, xik, the i is shared, so they are in the same row, let's say the first index indexes over rows, they're in the same row, so only one of them at most can have a queen present. What's missing here is the 1-1, one, one, because that's not allowed. Both of them cannot be one at the same time. We have similarly a constraint for 
all variables that are in the same column, J, that not both of them can be one at the same time. Then what we have here is a upward running diagonal, and what we have here is a downward running diagonal, encoding that again on a single upward running diagonal or a downward running diagonal. We cannot have two queens split. Yes. Absolutely. So what it says here is formulation one. So we'll see more formulations that are better for most purposes. Absolutely. So we'll get to that. At this point, are we done? Is this, if we were to feed this into our CSP solver, which you don't know yet how to build, let's assume somebody gave us a CSP solver. We feed in the variables, the domains, the constraints in explicit form. This is going to work. Suggestion over there. Exactly. The suggestion here is that if you look at this, a very simple way to satisfy all the constraints is to have the next variable equal to zero. And that's not a valid solution. So this just shows it's, it can be tricky to get things right. Make sure to think about whether you really have all constraints. In this case, we're missing the constraint that the sum of all these variables has to be equal to n. Once that constraint is in place, we're fine. Means, and we have the constraints that they don't attack each other. All right, formulation two. Here, there are only, for the four queens problem, only four variables, one corresponding to each row. And then the domain is in which column you place the queen for that row. Why can we do that? We know that we need one queen per row for this to succeed. And that knowledge we're encoding now in the problem formulation. It brings down the number of variables, which can be a good thing. We know when we're searching and so forth, the state space size can affect how long it takes. This brings down the domain size quite significantly, uh, the variable, the um, number of variables significantly. The domains grow a little bit. You now have one through n. What are the constraints now? Well, implicit, it's just that for every pair, qi, qj, they have to be non-threatening. That could be a piece of code that checks if you assign column, let's say, two to qi and column four to qj, are they threatening each other or not? Explicit. You do things like this for each pair of variables. You need to specify the possible combinations of values that they can that they are allowed to take on. All right. Now, one thing we can do, and we will be doing a lot in this class, is um, when you specify a problem, to look at the underlying structure. Constraint satisfaction problem is to look at the constraint graphs. So, what's a constraint graph? Um, for binary constraint satisfaction problem, meaning a problem where each constraint has only two variables participating in the constraint, a constraint graph looks something like this. Every variable in your constraint satisfaction problem is a node in the graph. Every constraint is an edge in the graph. So for the map coloring problem for Australia, it looks like this, right? Where the neighboring regions are connected by an edge, if they have a constraint between them. This is an abstract way of representing the structure in the problem that will turn out to be very useful in getting insight into how hard your problem might be. And we'll see that in the next lecture that some of the algorithms we'll, we'll propose will directly take advantage of what kind of graph structure you have here. For now, what you need to be able to do is to understand how you can turn a CSP into its corresponding constraint graph. One thing you can already see here is that, for example, Tasmania is disconnected from everything else. And they might give you some intuition about, well, that means that effectively there's a problem here. What's the problem that we can say we can solve two smaller problems? That's one way of exploiting structure. The graph falls into pieces. We'll see if there are other ways to exploit structure when the graph is only sparsely connected. All right, let's look at the end queens. Problem here. So here's the constraint graph for the five queens problem. What are we looking at here? We have variables A, A, B, C, D, E, corresponding in this case to each of the columns in the board. We have domains, 
each of these variables has a domain of one through five, corresponding to each of the rows that it might take on as its value where the queen is going to be placed in that particular column. And then for each pair of variables, we have a constraint. So A and E have a constraint between them, encoded by E to the edge over here, labeled as queen score, including the constraint that what combinations of values A and E can take on. Um, this particular formulation is using um, a naming for these constraints where, for example, queens one refers to constraints where you're only one column apart from each other. Those variables can take on. So you have one apart constraints over here, then you have the two apart constraints over here, three apart, and then four apart over there. So the set of constraints, set of variables, and in a little while we'll come back to this and show what happens when we solve this problem in this graph. Okay, let's look at another example. Not just about coloring maps, even though that will be how about cryptarithmetic? This is a puzzle problem. Some of you might have solved this kind of problem. What are you supposed to do here? Well, each of the letters in this thing over here corresponds to a number. In the number, this arithmetic equation here is supposed to be two plus two is four once you substitute the digits or the letters. So what are the variables? Well, the variables are all the letters that we're seeing here. And it turns out there are some extra variables here, x1, x2, x3, which correspond to the carry digits, right? When you do a summation like this, you know that you might have a carry over here from if r is larger, if o plus o is larger than nine, then the part that carries over to the next column. And so that would be, X1 here would be the first carry, X2 up here, and X3 would be the last carry, which happens to be an equal to F. What are the domains? The domains are numbers, 0 through 9. Constraints. Um, typically, you're required to give them all different numbers, so this is a constraint that has a lot of variables participating. There are other ways of encoding this constraint, right? This is an this well, and it's a piece of code that will check that it all takes on different values. Possibly, you would have a set of values each pair of variables can take on. Now, what other constraints do you have? We need O plus O to be R plus 10 times X1. So each of these summations has to be satisfied. And this is what the constraint graph looks like now. We don't have just binary constraints. We don't have just binary encode what structure we have for our CSP, we need to be more explicit about our constraints. So now our constraints are the square nodes in the graph. So this square node over here corresponds to the constraint that um, O plus O plus O plus O equals R plus 10 times X1. This one over here corresponds to this one over here. And this one here corresponds to u plus w plus x1 being, let's see, w plus w plus x1 equal to u plus x2, plus 10 times x2, and so forth. So, and then this one here is the old diff. That one encodes that every variable has to take on a different value. All right. Here's another one. This is one that more people might have played. Um, what's the problem here? You're supposed to fill in the empty squares with digits 0 through 9, actually 1 through 9, and you cannot use the same digit twice in a column or in a subsquare. Shown here, these are the subsquares, one of those. Um, 3 by 3, that 3 by 3, every digit can only be used once. So the variables correspond to each open square. The domains are all 1 through 9. The constraints are, you need a 9-way old diff for each column, a 9-way old diff for each row, and a 9-way old diff for each region. 
So at the end of this lecture, you'll know an algorithm to solve these kinds of problems for you if you get stuck. All right. Um, one thing that I'll also be getting now you look at our and if you have solved these problems, like sometimes you'll feel like you have to make a guess. Not sure what to do next. I right? That's going down in the search tree, exploring something, coming back if it didn't work, and going down another branch of the search tree. So this concept of difficulty that we have is also reflected in uh, how some of our algorithms work. All right, here's another one. Let's say you look at a computer vision problem here. You're getting an image. You want to interpret the geometry in that image. So let's make this concrete here. Look at this thing over here. Um, and it's kind of encapsulated something bigger over there. Any junction that you have, you want to interpret it well, that's not it as pointing at me or pointing away from me. If you look at this, indeed, you can interpret this two ways. You can think that this junction is the corner is away from you, and you're kind of looking at the corner of a room, or you can think of that you're looking at a cube that's pointing at you, and you're kind of looking at the bottom and sides of the cube that's pointing at you. So that's more than one interpretation of this particular line drawing. Constraint satisfaction problems, a really early one um, uh, put forward by Waltz, is um, this idea that it is true that every one of these junctions, every one of these edges could be an any or an Audi. Once you have many of them, there are constraints between them. Neighboring ones have to satisfy certain constraints, they have to be compatible. And so, usually, for example, you look at this, now there's one that's around your problem. So in this case, the constraint satisfaction problem would say um, every edge corresponds to a variable, and it could be a positive or a negative value corresponding to whether it's a convex or a convex thing, that whether it's pointing out of the scene or being like a corner in a row. Then there are constraints. If you have junctions, um, at a junction, only certain combinations are possible. I don't know them off the top of my head, but you can imagine that a plus pointing at you, right? This is also pointing out plus, and this is pointing out a plus, plus, plus junction of that type is possible. A negative, negative, negative might not be possible. A negative, positive, negative might not be possible. There's a finite set of um, values each of these junctions can take on. And then the junctions need to be compatible with your edge assignments. And that way, if you solve your constraint satisfaction problem, each solution is an interpretation of the geometry we see. In fact, I have a moment of this kind of um, approach will tell you that. It will show you that there is no solution because there's no consistent assignment of innies and outies and junctions that, uh, that is compatible with everything you have. All right, now there's a variety of CSPs and constraints, and we're not going to be looking at all of them. We're looking at a specific class of them. So let's look at the variables. The variables could have finite domains or infinite domains. We'll be looking at CSPs with variables with finite domains. When they're finite, they could be Boolean, zero, one valued domains, or could be more possible values. Um, infinite domains have a lot of interesting problems too. Let's say you're scheduling something and don't know how long it's going to take on the time How do you want to schedule things out? Well, then you might not want to put a limit on the time that can be taken on by your variables. Um, there are problems where maybe some variables might want to take on infinite values and so forth. So there's a lot of variability here in what we, you might want to do in a real world problem. We're going to restrict ourselves to these final domain cases. Um, you could also have confused variables. Sometimes it makes the problem harder, sometimes it makes the problem easier. Um, it's not something we're going to look at, um, but if you want to learn more about that, check out CS170, where there's some theory about how to deal with linear constraints and continuous variables. 
So continuous variables definitely have infinite domains. Okay, so we're going to look at this slice over here. One thing to keep in mind is that this includes Boolean satisfiability problems. If you've taken a class that considers computational complexity theory, where you say, well, what's the range of the problem as a function of the size of the problem, you might have some problems for which the random running time is exponential. And there's a whole class of them called empty complete problems. So train satisfaction problems can encode these empty complete problems. So a little bit of a warning here is be aware ahead of time that unless I'm going to unveil something really amazing that nobody's aware of yet in this class, we're not going to be dominant that guarantee you to be efficient on any problem. We're going to be hoping for something reasonably efficient for most problems that we might encounter. All right, the constraints can vary. So sometimes constraints are unary. This means that the constraint has only one variable participating in. Some constraints can be binary, which means there's two variables participating in it. And some constraints could take more than just one or two variables participating in them. Those are higher order constraints. We saw that in the Sudoku puzzle. We saw that in the cryptarithmetic problem. We'll look at hard constraints for now. You can also imagine that you say, well, you know, two and three are hard. I'd like to not communicate. Not as good a solution, right? And in previous lecture, we've seen things where some solutions are better than other solutions, and they might have a preference over some solutions and over others. That's not something we're going to look at when we're studying constraint satisfaction problems. Right now, what we're looking at is constraints that are hard constraints, you need to satisfy them. Either you satisfy them or you don't. It's a fully thing. There's nothing intermediate that we're willing to consider right now. Much later in this class, we'll see something called base nets, and that will allow us to do something very similar to what we did in our class. We'll impose soft constraints on the variables. Okay, what can real world CSPs look like? One example is an assignment problem. You could say, well, um, I need to assign instructors to classes, um, and there's certain instructors that can teach certain classes. Um, the certain classes Time tabling problems. Um, once that rooms, but not fit into a certain classroom. So there's a constraint there. For each class, what room they can fit in. Classes you can choose from. Then there's a time choice. What time are you going to offer the class? That again is a constraint satisfaction problem. And in principle, Canvas might be running a CSP solver to find your schedules. Um, not sure if that's what they're doing, but they could. Hardware configuration. So let's say you want to configure hardware. There can be constraints in terms of uh, how much how much power you're able to supply and how much power you need to supply. Transportation scheduling. Um, let's say you want to schedule flights, and you know you want a certain level of certain number of flights between certain. You also have a constraint, of course, that a, you can only have a flight if there's a plane there that has arrived from somewhere else to get there, and then moves on from there. So you have a constraint the flights, and that's a constraint satisfaction problem. There's similar problems in factory scheduling, circuit layout. Certain units need to be connected in a circuit layout. Um, pole diagnosis, um, you know that if certain symptoms might present themselves, but there are certain uh, causes that might cause that particular symptom and so forth. So a lot of CSPs out there, a lot of problems beyond just map coloring that can be formulated this way. It is true that a lot of these real world problems, time variables are taken continuously. The population is quite different actually how to deal with them. Um, and you would need to take something like uh, CS170 to 
Okay, linear programs or E127, which more generally looks at optimization problems over a continuous variable. Still a question there? So how do we solve them? A standard search formulation for CSPs could be as follows. You define your states in your search space as the values assigned so far. So partial assignments because it correspond to nodes in your search tree. Your initial state, the initial node in your search tree is the empty assignment that we start out with in your search tree. Your successor function says, well, what can I do next? I can pick any variable that's not assigned yet, assign any value to it in its domain, and then so you get a pretty big branching there. And if you keep running your search, you can already do this, you can implement this until maybe at some point your goal test is satisfied, meaning that all constraints are satisfied with a full assignment to the variables. We'll start with this really naive, straightforward approach. I know many of you will be urging and saying, well, that just seems so naive, that's not what we should be doing. You're right, but we'll start from here and build up from there. Okay, if we follow that kind of search formulation, what would Brett's first search do on this problem here? Well, we start with an empty search tree, empty assignment, and the top node. Then we can pick any variable, okay? So, successor function, any variable, and any of these variables could get any assignment. So we could go to, um, W A equals green. We could go to W A equals red. We could go to W A equals blue. We also go to N P equals green. You can pick your typical ground for a while. You'll have you have two, four, six, seven choices of variables, three choices of colors. So we'll be one. Then. Next thing it'll do, it'll branch again, and it kind of stripe through this tree layer by layer by layer until at the very bottom, means seven layers deep, somewhere here, we'll encounter an assignment that satisfies all the constraints. A lot of questions that will come up right now will be about why not doing this, why not doing that, and we're building up to it. So that's bread first search. Okay, what happens if instead we run depth first search? Well, we've been making a lot of fun of depth first search, always kind of striking through the bottom of the search tree, maybe even going in the wrong direction and so forth. But in this case here, we'll have the same kind of search tree structure. But striping through it, going all the way down, left to right, actually probably a better strategy than first. All the solutions are at the bottom, but the bottom is definitely a good idea. Um, we're not guided yet, we don't know where to go, but breadth first search wasn't guided either. Breadth first search was just naively exploring all the short paths first, which all have only partial assignments before it gets to the bottom. Depth first search seems a better starting point because Wherever your first solution is, somewhere here, you'll be done. You just explore this part of the tree, which is a lot less than breadth first search would do. Okay, so depth first search seems better. Um, of course, there's many problems. Let's look at a demo of this in action. So what we have here is a little applet that we'll be using a couple of times here. Um, we'll do the naive search. This is depth first search. So what happens? First thing happens, we assign one variable, in this case blue. What happens next? We go down one layer in the search tree, assign the next variable. I'm sorry, that was two at once. Next variable, blue. Next one, 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 blue. Now is the first time we reach the bottom of this search tree. At this point, we check the goal test. We realize we haven't satisfied the goal test. Um, we cannot expand from here, so that's a dead end. We backtrack. So we go back up in the search tree, one level. So next thing, next state we're considering, we'll start from here and then expand from there for red. Then we'll go green. Then we'll backtrack again, even further, and we'll keep going this way. Let's 
Um, just play this out and see what this takes. Faster, faster, faster. Let's go even faster. Get the picture. This takes a really long time to naively search through that tree. And you already know that these two blue ones here are already ruining it for you. But it's still spending all this time in the deeper part of the tree, thinking it might be able to fix something there, but there's no way it could. All right, so let's stop that. Let's stop that. We'll, 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 have, a, we'll have a better way of solving this later. So what problems does naive search have? What else is kind of naive about it? The whole idea of branching on every possible variable. Two main problems. We're going to fix those with something called backtracking search. Something where you can do it rather than having a judge at the end deciding whether you did it right or wrong, performing a build test. You have a police officer who's just hovering over you at all times during your search, and whenever you get something wrong, like calling two neighboring regions the same way, right? You need to backtrack. Okay, so backtracking search is the basic uninformed algorithm for solving CSPs. The idea is we only assign one variable per layer, so we choose maybe the first layer is WA, the second layer is NT, and so forth, but we don't consider all variables in every layer. Okay, that reduces the branching factor. And we set the constraints as you go. So as you assign a variable, rather than assigning blue, blue, blue to the same as happening before, you look at your domain for the variable that you're currently going to assign, you check the values in the domain. You say, okay, we're blue, red, and green left. Okay, that's reasonable. Blue, red, and green. Which of these values are consistent with the variables I already have assigned? And you only branch on the ones that are consistent with what you already have. Okay? So this is a way of incrementally testing as you go along your search, whether you satisfy the goal test to the extent you can test it so far. This is called backtracking search. Um, it's probably the algorithm you would have come up with rather than the one I showed you if I told you we're going to run depth first search. It's kind of the more natural way of running depth first search. This can solve n queens problems of, with board sizes up to 25. Okay, so how does that look in the search tree? So we start with, again, nothing colored, empty set of assigned variables. Then we pick a variable for the first layer. We pick that leftmost state. Three options, red, green, blue. Then we're still doing a depth first search, right? It's just now augmented with that check whether you are still valid as you go along. So in this case, the neighboring territory is not colored in red because that wouldn't be valid. Just green and blue are considered and so forth. So you get checks along the way. In still depth first search, you might still go down paths that are not going to succeed. That's still a possibility, right? It's still not guided search. You're just going down just making sure you haven't already failed and keep searching. What, the code, what does the code look like? So the, this sort of code looks like, back, like a recursive implementation, but you can also do this in a way that we looked at for regular search where you had a fringe. But let's look at this recursive implementation. So how does it start? You feed in, um, initially, the NP set of assignments and the CSP. What does it mean to feed in a CSP? It means you have something that allows you to check where the and allows you to um, check the domains of the variables. Okay, then we call recursive backtracking search with the empty assignment so far. Then you just return. Once you achieve the complete assignment, initially that of course won't be true. Um, will not be complete when you pass in an empty assignment. Then you select an unassigned variable. 
from the set of variables in the CSP based on the current assignment you have in the CSP. Right, based on the F value, there will be something similar here that we'll see at the end of lecture, how you can be smart about which variable to pick next. But for now, we just assume there's some mechanism picking the next variable. For this first search, it would just be alphabetical tie breaking or something. Then for each value in, in the domain for the variable that we just picked, we check. Is that value consistent with the assignment we have so far? If it is not consistent, then we're done with that value. We don't have to branch on that value. We're right away done. If it is consistent, then we are branching on that value. We add that value for that variable to the assignment. So our assignment has now grown. More variables have been assigned. We then make a recursive call. We now call backtracking search again with this augmented assignment. We keep going that way. Once this backtracking search comes back here, um, if it returned failure, then you just return that, sorry, if it returns a result that's not failure, you just return that result and you'll pass that all the way back up and you'll have a solution. If it does return failure, that means that somehow the assignments you made so far, as you go further down the tree, you realize there's nothing that you can do to, to achieve success. You might have made some wrong decisions early on, but you weren't aware that they were wrong because you hadn't considered the later variables yet. But once you consider those later variables, you found out that you couldn't succeed with those early assignments. So it comes back and says, that early assignment leads to no solutions underneath in that part of the search tree. So you have to backtrack, and that's what's happening here. You remove that last assignment that you made from your set of assignments, move on to the next value for that variable, and maybe now that subtree will have success, hopefully. So that's backtracking search. What are the choice points? There are two choice points. Which variable do you choose to assign to next? And then as you are assigning values to a variable, do you have a choice which value to assign first? Be clever about those choice points. Aside from that, this is a straight up approach that doesn't depend on anything in the problem. Uh, you just kind of run it for any CSP that gets fed into it. Okay. So let's do the backtracking version of the previous demo. So we now switch from a naive search to backtracking search. What happens now? So we start with the empty assignment, assign the first variable. This is just alphabetical tie breaking or some kind of tie breaking scheme over colors. Blue is first. Now we don't assign blue to the next one. We know that blue would not satisfy the constraints with the first one. So it doesn't get branched on. Next one blue. And so every time we go deeper in the tree, so we have more variables assigned, it's always made sure that that new assignment is compatible with everything we've assigned so far. At this point, there's no compatible assignment. The next variable cannot be assigned a color that's consistent with what we have done so far. That means, well, there's no solution in this subtree of our search tree. We have to backtrack. So the next thing would be to uncolor that one replace it by its next option, um, but there is no next option because it has neighbors that are red and neighbors a neighbor that's blue. So you actually go back even further. Now this one could get its next color, which would be green. You try again, there's nothing then next. And so you see you backtrack whenever you don't have an assignment available. And this actually succeeds much more quickly than what we had before. It has to do a couple of backtracking, but that's it to get to the solution. Okay, so how can we further improve backtracking compared to what we just looked at, right? We'll look at ordering, we'll look at filtering, and we'll look at structure in the next lecture. So let's take a two minute break now and then look at how we can improve what we have. The first thing we're going to look at is something called filtering. So the first type of filtering we're going to look at is called forward check. Now in our number, we'll do an addition. We'll keep track of the We'll keep track of its filter domain, being that the original domain.
forward checking does is in a very particular way, you cross off values that violate a constraint when adding to the existing assignment. So let's look at forward checking in action here for the map coloring problem. Let's say we first, first color um, WA in red, right? That's one step down in our search tree. Now, as we color WA in red, what happened here in forward checking is that we realized its neighboring states or territories cannot be red. The neighboring states slash territories are these two, and so red was removed from the domain of both of them. Not have red anymore. Um, what happens next? Let's say we assign um, green to the one on the top right. Then what happens is we get one of them assigned, and then all of the neighboring ones, this one, this one, this one, get their green erased because green is not possible anymore. So the neighbors in this case are this one, this one, and this one, and all three of them get green erased. You are filtering out values in the domains of other variables. Okay, we can keep going, right? We can assign another variable. Let's say we now assign blue. Um, this is what we end up with. We filter and see what happens here. What happens is that this domain became empty. We know that that subtree. Will not have a solution. No matter what you have, you're going to have no solution because you're going to have no color left for that essay territory trying to get a valid assignment. So, what this allows you to do is to backtrack early. You can now say, oh, I already know this subtree will not have a successful completion. I can backtrack right here, right now, instead of continuing on until I'm actually looking at that variable and deciding I have to backtrack. Question here. Excellent question. So this is foreshadowing the next technique we're going to look at. If you look at what's happening here, you have blue and blue in neighboring states. We know that's not going to succeed. We already could have known right here that we should backtrack. Forward checking doesn't know this. And then prune the domains of the other variables participating in those constraints according to what you've just assigned. That's the only thing it does. Now, if you look at this carefully, you say, well, even though I haven't assigned blue to those variables, we know that's the only possible thing in our Get to that in just two slides from now. All right. So let's look at a demo first before we do that. So now let's look at still look at the simple graph. We do still do backtracking. We now have forward checking in place. All right. So still the first thing. We still a backtracking search. We assign blue in this case. We now see that domains of the neighboring nodes, the neighboring uh, nodes in the graph get pruned. Blue has disappeared. We move on, color the next one red. Again, domains are getting pruned. Keep going. And as we go, domains keep getting pruned, right? And this stage, we reach a phase where there's an empty domain, which means we need to backtrack. So we backtrack, backtrack some more. And then we're able to proceed again. What we see is we still have some backtracking happening. Our we had when just doing the naive backtracking search without doing the forward checking. Let's take a look at what else we can do, which was already kind of mentioned in the discussion we just had. Once we reach this point over here, let's say we're doing a backtracking search with forward checking, we're left with the domain for NT having just blue, the domain for SA having just blue. Um, your neighboring regions 
So we know that's not going to succeed anymore going down this part of the search tree. We should just backtrack if we were made aware of that. Um, what's different here is we're checking a constraint between var two variables that are just any two variables really here, as opposed to in forward checking where we just look at the variable we just assigned for that variable, we look at the constraints it participates in and see if we can, based on those constraints, prune the domains of other variables participating in those constraints. So what we're going to do now is propagate those constraints to look at all constraints in our CSP and series based on any of those constraints, can we prune some domains based on the assignments we have so far and based on the filtering we have done so far. All right, so we know that we can in principle detect this. Constraint propagation will do this for us. How does it work? So let's say we want to check the satisfaction of a particular constraint. It will be called enforcing consistency of a single arc in this case. We say an arc x to y. The direction matters, actually. The arc x to y is consistent, even only if for every x in the domain of the uh, tail variable, there is some y in the domain of the head variable, which could be assigned without violating a constraint. Okay? So let's take a look at what that means. Initially, let's say we assign red to wa, and we now start enforcing consistency of arcs. Let's look at this arc here. So we're going to check. We need to ensure that in the tail, which is this one over here, every value, of, every value that's available there needs to have something consistent with it in the head. How about red? Is there something consistent with red in the head? No, because all we have in the head is red. And if we assign, these are neighboring regions, so we cannot assign red to the tail variable, so we get rid of this. All right. Next, let's say we look over here at the arc between Q and WA. Q and WA are not neighboring regions. There's really no constraint between them. Um, any value for Q is okay with the current coloring of WA. And the mnemonic that you have to keep in mind here is just because it's really a convention rather than something logical is that you always take things out of the tail. So think of getting, running into some traffic check, the cops check your trunk and start taking things out of your trunk. The tail is where things get removed. That's your mnemonic to remember what it means to enforce consistency of a single arc. Okay, always delete from the tail. Now, what does forward checking do in this context? Forward checking enforces consistency of a certain set of arcs. It enforces consistency of arcs going into the variable that was just assigned. But that's it. There's a lot more arcs you can draw. You can draw arcs between all pairs of variables. Forward checking only considers the arcs going into the variable you just assigned. Okay, what if we are going to consider all arcs instead of just the one, the ones pointing into the variable we just assigned? That's called enforcing arc consistency. Let's say we're at this stage over here. Um, let's consider this arc over here. V and NSW are neighboring regions. How about red? Is red okay for V? Yes, because blue for NSW is compatible with that. How about green for V? Yes, because red and blue actually are both compatible with that. How about blue for V? Yes, because red is compatible with that. So nothing can be pruned for this particular enforcement of this particular arc. Go to the next one. SA pointing into NSW. NSA has blue as the only value. We need to check for that value. Is it consistent with something in NSW? Yes, red is still available. So we cannot prune anything again from the tail of this arc. How about the arc pointing in the other direction. How about red? Red is okay because blue is compatible with that. How about blue? Blue for NSW is not okay because we only have blue in SA. And since we only have blue, blue is not compatible with blue for NSW. It's not going to work, so we get rid of blue over here. All right, what if we now again look at the arc we looked at initially? We've already enforced consistency for that arc earlier on and nothing happened. What if we look at it again now? Is red still okay? Actually, no, because now blue has disappeared. Only red is left for, the, for NSW, so red is not okay anymore for V. 
So what happened here is really important. As you prune domains, some arcs need to be reconsidered. In fact, all arcs that point into a, a variable where something was removed from the domain of the variable, all those arcs pointing into that variable need to be reconsidered because maybe now you can do something that you couldn't do before. All right, so it's important if x loses a value, neighbors of x need to be rechecked. Our consistency detects failure earlier than forward checking because it's checking so much more consistency between the variables. It's looking at all these filter domains and assigned variables and making sure they're all consistent. You can run this as a preprocessor. So before you start your backtracking search, you can run, you can enforce our consistency. Then after you assign a variable, you can rerun our consistency. You can keep repeating this after every assignment as you go along in your search. Is there a downside to using our consistency over forward checking? It can take more time, right? It can be, you have to start into all these arcs and maybe if you're a CSP and so many solutions that no matter where you go down, you're probably gonna find a solution and all that checking might be redundant work. Depends on the problem, whether it be faster or slower. And it depends on how fast it is to enforce those constraints. Yes? It seems like if you reorder it, it makes a lot more sense. We'll get to that, absolutely. This is what our consistency look, looks like as an algorithm. In words, what does it do? You start off with setting up a queue. In that queue, you put every arc that, you, that, is, that exists in your CSP. Um, one thing to think, to be aware of here, what we're talking about here is for CSPs with binary constraints. So the way we describe our consistency assumes binary constraints. So you look at all pairs of variables that have some constraint between them. Put all those pairs of variables onto your queue as arcs, and you put them in both directions. So A, B, and B, A goes off, go on. Then you just pop from your queue. You enforce our consistency for that particular arc. If anything gets pruned, then you reload onto your queue every arc that points into the variable from which you just did some pruning. Of course, you don't need arcs more than once in your queue, so you don't need duplicates on your queue. That's the system. You keep going, so at some point your queue is empty. At that point, you fully enforce our consistency. Okay, let's look at a demo of this in action. So let's go back to the end queens problem. So where's our end queens problem? Over here. Let me show this demo and let's see if there are questions left after showing the demo. So this is our end queens problem. If we initially force our consistency, which we do out of our consistency, we see that all the initial constraints are colored blue, meaning they are still on the queue. Everything that's blue is on the queue. Everything that flashes is what currently popped from the queue and being enforced. And when it's green, it's off the queue. And so this keeps going until every one of these arcs has been checked. And after every one of them has been checked, they're all off the queue. None of them resulted in any pruning because all the domains are still one through five and any pair of um, values, for any value in one domain, you still have something compatible in the neighboring domain. All right, let's now assign a value to one of these. So, um, assign the number four, let's say. So row four for column D, okay? So now the domain has shrunk. We've made an assignment. At this point in our backtracking search with our consistency, we're going to run our consistency. So what does that mean? We um, we just made an assignment to this variable over here. That's the one whose domain has changed. So all arcs pointing into that variable have to of our queue. Okay. So that's this blue one over here is in our queue, this blue one here, this blue one here. So we have three arcs in our queue. Then we're going to step by step the this method will choose one of those constraints, um, enforces it. Now what you saw happen is that there are actually now more <coughs> arcs on the queue. What happened is it checked C into D, it pruned the domain of C accordingly. Now every arc pointing into C is put onto the queue. So the queue just grew. Then it picks another one, forces our consistency. The domain of A shrunk by all arcs pointing into A are put onto the queue. And we'll keep going, and every time we the domain, new arcs get added to the queue. 
And so I'm going to let it auto-complete here. At this point, we're still only one step deep in our search tree. We've just signed the, we have now enforced our consistency. And we're left with each of the remaining variables having relatively small domains. Next thing that would happen in our search is we would pick one of those remaining variables. Maybe we pick B, who knows? We assign some value. Okay. And then all arcs pointing into B would be put in our queue. We would enforce our consistency. See what happens. But then every domain has only one value. too deep in our search tree and then enforcing our consistency, we're left with every variable having a domain of size one. To be done and have found the solution. Would it have been possible that a domain had become empty? Absolutely. I guess I made a lucky choice in assigning four to D and then five to B, which just happened to work out. A different choice could have led to an empty domain, in which case we'd have had to backtrack and then go down a different part of our search tree. Okay, that's enforcing our consistency in our backtracking search. What are the limitations of our consistency? After you're done with enforcing our consistency, it's what we have. We got lucky, we got this thing over here. We got this option here, happened to the first one. Oh, it's still in white. Invisible. Um, let's go back to red. We have one solution left. That means you are done because you're satisfied. We have multiple solutions left. Let's say you do the coloring problem and you're left with this over here. But there's more than one, one value left in your domains. There's no guarantee that anything you pick is going to be a solution. You have to continue your backtrack search. There be no solutions left. This could this could be a case. So it's possible I end up with something like this. So when in your search, maybe some part of your app looks like this. <coughs> but we know there's no solution because the way this is set up, this problem has no solution if you only get to use red and blue for each of these variables. But our consistency is not aware of it. So it is possible after you put our consistency, it still tells you. It's not, you just will assign a variable, and force our consistency again. Okay. So keep that in mind, our consistency is not a way to solve your CSP, it's a way to do filtering as you run backtracking search to speed up your backtracking search. So let's look at a demo of our consistency in our applet here. Let's, let's, let's look at what happens first if we run um, still backtracking search, but now forward checking, but in a bigger problem. So this is our new problem. It's a little bigger. Okay. Backtracking search with filtering, and the type of filtering is forward checking. So we assign a variable. All arcs pointing into the variable we just assigned will be enforced to be consistent, which in this case is for two variables, the domain is being pruned. Next, we'll keep kind of striping through our assignments here. Now, look at what's going on here. Just doing forward checking, we have green and green that are neighboring. Just one entry left in the domain here, one here, and they're neighboring. We know there's going to be no solution, but we are running backtracking search with just forward checking, so we just continue. We 
Don't, we are not aware of that. Keep going. Still not aware of that. At this point, we become aware of that. We see there's an empty domain. At this point, backtracking search with forward checking will backtrack. Um, now, spending some time there, spending quite a bit of time backtracking. And you see it's actually wasting time, right? Because it's trying things that still have both of those green. They're neighboring and they're green. And everything it's trying here, it's not changing that. So once it goes back far enough, Still not back far enough, but someone goes back all the way. Still not there. Don't want to go back there, that it comes up with a different assignment for that first variable that was already filled with the degree now to become red, and it might be able to make some progress. So you see, it's doing a lot of work here. They're not aware of what really is causing the backtracking. Now, think about what happens with our consistency. So, we run this with our consistency. Of course, our consistency, so we assign first variable. Of course, our consistency, which in this case doesn't do much yet. Then, next time, next variable again, of course, our consistency. What we see here, we see some things happening. This one became green. We then had all arcs pointing into that one being enforced, meaning over here we got green pruned and over here we got green pruned. So we wouldn't even have that option available later that got us stuck earlier on. Um, again, we'll make an assignment. All arcs into the variable get enforced and any domain that gets pruned, it's arcs pointing into it get enforced and so forth. And we see we already have kind of a structure with solution emerging here, even though we've only made three assignments so far. Keep going, assigning variable in our search, enforcing our consistency. And we see we actually can solve this problem without any backtracking so far. We haven't run into any trouble so far. At this point, we end up with empty domains. So we made the wrong choice somewhere. We have to backtrack, hopefully not too far. With one time backtracking, we actually found a solution. How we go through our search string. Okay, so what's left? There's something else we can do. Is it the strategy for the variable? Minimum remaining values. What's the idea there? Well, what is the strategy for the search left to right, bottom to top? What happens if we do something a little different? We now incorporate this minimum rem remaining values heuristic in our backtracking search. And let's just do forward checking because with our, cons with our consistency on such a small problem, we're already pretty much done. So we do forward checking, but a heuristic in how we pick which variable to assign next. So we start here. Now, two domains have only two val values left. Those are preferred because we have a better idea of what to pick there. Now, we pick the one with only one value left. We pick the one with only two values left. One with only, there's a tie here. We pick one of the ones with two values left. And so we consistently pick the domain with the least values left. And we do forward checking. And as we go along, see that forward checking with this heuristic and choosing which variable to pick next, without any backtracking at all. This was still just forward checking, but the filter domains were now used to decide which, uh, which variable to pick next. So we choose a variable with the fewest legal values in the domain. So usually in the coloring problem will be the neighbors of what you already colored. Why min rather than max? So why is the max good? Many options left. Well, you want to pick a name. The domain is small. That means that for that variable, the assignments you have already made have informed you about what you should do for that variable. Rather be informed about the variable that you're going to assign next as much as possible. And the way you are informed is by the domain having shrunk. All right, so we've seen that picking the right variable in our search next can make a big difference. The most constraints 
The way pretend is fail fast, we want to, if a variable is constrained, we have very few options left. The branch in fact will be low. If we then don't find anything, we'll backtrack quickly. Because we know that something earlier on resulted in, a, in this failure. How about the values? We do the opposite. It's the least constraining value first. What do I mean with that? You look at the domains of, you look at your domain separately. <laughs> You said here, we want to treat the both the same value and fail fast. That's true. We want to take that Why is that? Because when we make our picks here, um, it might it might determine how big of our of a search tree we end up with. Because it determines our branching factor. A variable with very few values left is a small branching factor. We build a smaller search tree. When we are down here, and we're choosing values. And all we're doing is choosing an ordering of going through it. We'd rather go first where we think it's most likely to find a solution because once we find a solution, we're done. So that's why here you want to take the, take the most promising path first. All right, um, let's take a look at what that allows us to do. For the end Queen's problems, you do this backtracking search with MRV and LCV. You can do up to Thousand queens. Let's look at our demo. We enable MRV with LCV and forward checking. See what happens. Kind of in, it informs us how we should strike through this tree. And again, we find a solution very efficiently. In this case, again, without any backtracking, we randomly strike to the right solution. All right, that's it for today.